Well, good evening, and welcome to the Faculty Research Seminar. Uh, my name is Eric Jones, and I'm a professor of European Studies. Now, one of the things that we do at SAIS is create opportunities in the world to bring faculty together. And so on the, the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November of this year, we organized a midterm election in the United States so that we could then come and talk to you about it. <clears throat> With the idea being to help you better to understand not just what happened in a, in a newsy sense, but, but and much more fundamentally, how the size education helps you better to interpret what you're seeing than you would get from the news. In other words, what's the value added that you can generate by looking at things just a little bit more deeply from a little bit of a different perspective. Now, uh, you guys haven't seen enough of me this semester. I promise we'll make that up next time around. But, but, but one of the things I always like to tell people is I come from Texas, and, and that gives me an opportunity to talk about Texas. And, 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 and Texas is actually really interesting in this midterm cycle, and I'm going to use it as an illustration of the problems that we're going to face, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists and, and, and let them help you uh, understand a little bit better what a science education can offer, and then give you the chance to challenge them to probe ever more deeply uh, in, in, into the analytic framing. So the story goes like this. There's this weird guy, his name's Beto O'Rourke, uh, who decided to run against this supremely weird guy named Ted Cruz. And, 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 and so these two guys are running for the Senate seat in the great state of Texas. Now, when I grew up in Texas, all the senators were Democrats. Somehow that changed. Now all the Texas senators are Republicans, and they're trying to change it back again. And, and this guy, Beto O'Rourke, uh, ran with a very open campaign. He was very inclusive. He didn't point a lot of fingers. He said some controversial things, like immigrants are not all evil. And, and, and along the way, he offered an image of society that was actually quite attractive for many people. And surprisingly, in a very red state, a very Republican state, the election was super close. It was razor thin with 8 million votes cast, right, because Texas is a big state. Population-wise, it's as big as the Netherlands. And, and, and with 8 million votes cast, he only lost by 200,000 votes. And so you could come away from this and think, my goodness, you know, that was a really close race. But then consider this. Now, I grew up in Dallas County. And in Dallas County, Beto O'Rourke won by 230,000 votes, right? In Harris County down in Houston, he won by 240,000 votes votes. In Tarrant County, right, which is where Fort Worth is, for those of you who don't know, he won there too. In Bexar County, which is where San Antonio is, he won by another 150,000 votes. As a matter of fact, you can go to every major urban area in Texas, and he won by almost as much as the margin that Ted Cruz won by across the state as a whole. So how did Ted Cruz do it? Well, what he did basically is go to every rural area and rack up Stalinist victories, right? <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, I went to this one place. It's called Montague County, which is right up on the Texas-Oklahoma border. For every Beto O'Rourke vote in that town, Ted Cruz got seven votes, right? And so you ask yourself, wait a minute, was this a close election? Or was this a series of blowouts, one way or the other, where two different societies are living cheek by jowl? And, and, and the answer is probably more the latter than the former. America is a deeply divided place. And the more you drill down, the deeper these divisions become. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, what does that mean for the way our politics unfolds? Because the neat thing about the state of Texas is we don't have an electoral college. But if I multiply that experience across the United States as a whole, we're going to get a very different outcome. Because across the United States as a whole, Ted Cruz wouldn't even need to win the popular vote to win the electoral college. All he'd need to do is to rack up those Stalinist majorities in every rural district, and he'd walk away easily with an electoral college majority. So we've got to ask ourselves, okay, if that's the situation that we're in, 
how do we heal this divide in American politics? How do we even understand this divide in American politics? And, and, and what are the implications of a failure to understand what these elections actually reveal about the state of politics in America today? Now, now what we're going to do is bring together a multidisciplinary panel. We've got to my far right, Filippo today, who's going to talk a bit about the market reactions and give us a sense of the economic implications. He's our economist, right? Next to Filippo, <coughs> we're not quite sure what David is, but, <laughs> but David Unger has had a career both as an historian and as a journalist, and he's going to help us both to understand the context in the domestic sense and the implications for foreign policy. John Harper is a similar unique individual. He's an historian by training, but he's covered vast periods of American history and teaches American foreign policy, so we're going to get the domestic and the international from Professor Harper as well. And then Justin Frazzini is our lawyer who's going to help us to understand fundamentally what this means in terms of our constitutional mechanics, whether this is setting us up for a series of pointless impeachment proceedings or, or something even more disastrous as we jam up the whole system of government uh, and, and then ask whether the United States can function without a government for another two years running. Now, <clears throat> these are just the preliminary questions that I have to ask, uh, and, and I'm going to try to organize this in as informal a way as possible. So I'll ask people questions, and then they'll talk as long as they talk, and I'm going to allow them to cross-talk as well in case they disagree, and there will be disagreement. Of that, I can be reasonably confident. Um, and, and, and at a certain point, you guys are going to get bored, and, and so please do put your hands up, and I'll recognize you, and you can come in either with a short comment, right, because we're the ones who get to talk at length, so you must be concise. That's the training a size degree can offer, right, <laughs> the concision that your professors don't demonstrate. Uh, you, can make a short, uh, you can make a short comment or, or ask a question uh, either to the panel as a whole or directed to any member of it, Okay. So are we ready to proceed? So the, I, I think the first thing that we've got to ask, uh, and, and I'm going to start with David and then go over to John, and then the, the first thing that I'm going to ask is, uh, David, are, 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 are we in a hopelessly polarized American situation? What do the exit polls show? Do, do we have any common ground in American politics anymore? I think you described it very well in that two nations living cheek by jowl who are overwhelmingly one or the other. So is that a polarized situation? I don't know. I mean, our constitution, our system was designed to manage factions, to, to, to deal with factions in, in, in a constructive way. Um, I think that what's striking to me about the two-year lead-up to this year's election is how little either side talked to the other side's face. I mean, normally you had a close election in 2016, popular vote one way, electoral vote the other way, Senate 51-49 house margin within range where it could be flipped, you would think, you go, you talk to the other side and you say, why did you vote for the Democrats? Here, we Republicans can offer you this. Or why did you vote for the Republicans? You can offer this. That didn't happen. The two sides, the, the, the campaigners on two sides, called the other side's names. And the effort was not to win votes that had been, ca that had been cast the other way, but to turn out, turn out on their own side. And that's what they succeeded in doing. We had a much increased turnout, and particularly among younger voters, millennials, and suburban voters, which is why there was that small democratic wave that tipped a number of House seats. But John, I, I mean, I think what David is describing is, is a situation that sounds relatively worrisome, but is this something that we see often in American politics? Is, it, is this sort of business as usual in a much more exaggerated way, or, or are we looking at something that's fundamentally changed over the course of the last two or three decades? Do, do you mind if I ignore that question and tell you what, what I prepared to say here? <laughs> Please. Um, we all do that anyway. Well, sorry, I wasn't. Well, to answer your question briefly, I can't think of a decade in my lifetime when people weren't lamenting the degree of polarization. And I think, uh, I mean, and then if you go back, go back to the 19th century, uh, the 1850s, or, the, or the go back to, give me a decade in American history since the 1790s when people weren't uh, concerned about the uh, 
the imminent collapse of the republic for the, these, these two cultures, two nations at each other's throats. I mean, it, so it's, it's really the, the, I'm not sure that that's a comforting thought or not because uh, uh, the situation is in some ways dire. But w what I prepared to say, uh, and I'll, I'll just give you a, a blurb, I have two or three here. Um, what, what does all this mean for Trump himself? What do these elections mean for him? I'll start with that question. And what do they mean for the Democrats and what do they mean for foreign policy? I'll just take maybe the first one first. Trump, of course, the day after the elections declared that it had been a great victory. I mean, he knew, uh, which is what you might have expected him to say, it was not a great victory. He knew it was not a great victory. But certainly there was some good news for him. Uh, the fact that the Republicans held the Senate, that, that they won important races in uh, states like Ohio, and uh, unless things turn out badly for them in Florida, two governorships, uh, they flipped states like North Dakota and Missouri and so on and so forth. So they have, a, they have a, a stranglehold on the Senate, even if these recounts go in favor of the Democrats, they'll still control the Senate. That means Trump will very, may very well be able to appoint a third justice to the Supreme Court before 2020, uh, which is a, a, a frightening prospect for many. I mean, how long is Ruth Bader Ginsburg going to hang on? I mean, she's going to do as well as she can, but uh, uh, the chances are that uh, there'll be a third opportunity, certainly if he's reelected. Then you'll have a Supreme Court like the one that made decisions like the Dred Scott decision in the 1850s, which brought the, the country to the verge of civil war, or the kinds that tempted, uh, in the 30s, tempted Rose Franklin Roosevelt to pack the Supreme Court because he was so, so frustrated with the situation and the consistent knocking down and, and declaration of uh, throwing out of New Deal legislation. So there is good news for Trump. But there's, I think there's also bad news. I think over on the whole, I think Democrats should be encouraged by these, by these elections. I think there are things to take away that should, uh, uh, that should fuel optimism on the part of the Democrats. Take, for example, the, the races in, in uh, Pennsylvania, my state, which I, f I follow very cl closely, I, I still vote there. Take, uh, take Michigan, take Wisconsin, three states which, as you know, Trump won, and to the shock of many, but which had been won twice by Obama, and which the Democrats would uh, dearly like to get back. Consider the fact that in 2016, uh, well consider the fact that if in 2020, a Democratic candidate could hold the states that Hillary Clinton <coughs> won. And that's saying a lot, but assuming that a Democratic candidate will not, does not lose the states that Hillary Clinton won, add to those, those, add to that total of 232 electoral votes, add Pennsylvania, add back Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and you have 276 vote, uh, electoral votes. You have a Democrat in the White House. Even if you don't, even if you lose uh, Florida and Ohio, you can still win with that total. So I think that's reason for optimism on the part of Democrats. Of course, that raises the question: which Democrat will be able to, will be able to do that? And that's a, that's something that I'm I would like to discuss further, but uh, maybe in the next round. The the last takeaway, maybe the most important takeaway for Donald Trump from these elections is that we are now entering, the, and this would have been true regardless of the outcome of the elections, we are now entering the end game of the Mueller investigation. And that's why, and he, I think he would have done this immediately, the first thing he did after the elections was to fire his attorney general, to replace him with uh, somebody who even Republicans are scratching their heads about. Uh, this man, um, uh, what's his name, Matthew Whitaker, who was Sessions' chief of staff is now, is now acting Attorney General of the United States. Why is he that acting Attorney General of the United States? Because he's now in a position to either fire uh, Mueller, which he could do, or to take his report and put it in, in a drawer and forget about it, uh, assuming that the, the report is gonna, I think the report, I mean, clearly Mueller kept a low profile during the elections, didn't he? He, couldn't have, he wouldn't have come out beforehand. He's, he's, got, he's not going to be able to release his report once the presidential campaign gets going in earnest, say a year from now. So I would expect in the next six months, even less, that he will come out with his report. What is in it? Uh, well, who knows? It, it, will it fizzle? Will it be a bombshell? Will it be a, an anticlimax? 
I don't know, but I suspect that Trump is uh, probably nervous and with good reason about what the possible content of that report is. And therefore, uh, I wouldn't, people have, have, this has sort of dropped off the radar screen. People were much more uh, fix it, fixated on this subject a year ago than they are now, but I think we're going to be revisiting the, the whole Mueller uh, investigation and the implications. And I think I'll stop there and then come back to the, uh, the question of which, which Democrat could put together this combination of electoral votes that I'm talking about. If this, is, if this indeed is a path, a plausible path to the White House, uh, who could do it? So there are, you'll notice in both of these, these very brief opening comments, significant legal constitutional issues have, have arisen, whether the U.S. Constitution actually is well designed to, to accommodate faction. I think that's, that's an, interesting, uh, a, a, an interesting question. Um, talked a little bit about the Electoral College, uh, talked about packing the court with, with justices of one ideological shape or another, and then about executive privilege and, and the relations between the, the executive as chief executive in, in, in the legal order per se, right, whether you can have a special counsel that's overruled. There's such a tangled nest here, Justin. Uh, I, I guess my question is, are we heading to a constitutional crisis uh, of one sort or another, or do we think the machinery is robust enough uh, to sort this nest out uh, without breaking anything? I think, I think the machine that has been robust up until now, I mean, it's very, it's very t difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So, I mean, um, but uh, certainly this is, if we were, let's put it this way, as a comparative constitutionalist, we would have had a constitutional crisis well before now if we'd have been in another, in another country, in my opinion. I mean, I think once again, we, uh, we're in the presence of what is uh, an element of, of exceptionalism of, of, uh, of the US's constitutional design. David is absolutely right. It's, it's constructed in such a way as to be able to deal with, uh, with divided government. But I, I, I'm not sure whether I would define this as divided government. I think we're, we're well beyond that in many, in many respects. I mean, this isn't just a, a battle between the Democrats and the Republicans. This is, you know, the, the decision taken that John was mentioning by, uh, by Trump to, to, to remove Sessions and replace him with Whitaker. Uh, I mean, it, that's a pretty serious move from a, from a, from a legal constitutional perspective. Will he fire Mueller? Again, I'm looking into the crystal ball. I don't think so. I think he'll probably be more subtle and maybe uh, move some of the attorneys that are working with him in, in his special team, move them to other offices just to obstruct things. Every time a request is made, a subpoena, Whitaker could say, right, there's not enough evidence, go back, do your paperwork. Okay? And this obviously allows bites for time. And that's what John was saying. Certainly, we can't have this report coming out the year of the, of the presidential election. So there are, there are various subtle ways with, the, with, uh, with which uh, Whitaker can kind of obstruct what is happening. Moreover, but maybe this is something we would come, come back to, to later, as you were anticipating, uh, any attempt at impeachment of, of, of Trump is probably going to end up being a waste of time because we are well beyond the majority needed in the Senate to be able to, to impeach the, the president. It was, we all knew from the very start that this was the most difficult, uh, probably, I, I, I don't want to be wrong on this, but historically probably one of the most difficult senatorial elections ever for one party because there was, they had so many seats that they had to defend with respect to the other side. I mean, most of the senatorial seats were already Democrats. Now, unless there are, uh, there's good news from Arizona or Florida, okay, um, it's, it's still gonna be, it's still gonna be 51-49. You need 67 votes to be able to impeach the president. And I'm not convinced that in, in the two years that are leading up to the presidential election, the Democrats are going to find Republicans prepared to, to, to impeach the president. Of course, it will depend a lot, again, I adhere to what John was just saying, it will depend a lot on what the Mueller report actually, actually contains. But uh, I'll leave this maybe for, for a next round, but I'm, I'm not even sure, and this is moving from the legal to the political, I'm not even sure whether the Democrats really should be uh, pursuing this, uh, 
this impeachment. Maybe this is these, in these two years, what the Democrats should be doing is trying to underline and get out the message what they represent in terms of policy so as to win the next presidential elections. So, it's been, I mean, the story that you're telling is, is that this is interesting but not dramatic, right? I mean, and, and, and the reason that I frame it that way is because the market reaction has been pretty tame, right? It's not like, not like anybody is doing the hair on fire thing uh, on Wall Street. Uh, the U.S. economy is not doing so great as it was in the heyday of the Trump boom, but, it, but, it, but it's not dying either. FIFO, is this a big nothing burger in terms of economic implications, or is there something, something uh, more substantive uh, that we should be considering? Thanks, uh, Erica. And uh, finally, <coughs> I mean, first, uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that you, you, you said economists so you, like, like you, were, you meant an insult, okay? But, uh, uh, but you know, the, the point, you know, since I'm out of government, I can answer your question in the most uh, uh, intelligent way, which is, uh, I don't know. It's doubtful. <laughs> okay. And, you know, now, trying to be serious for, for, uh, for one second. So it is true that the market haven't reacted, but that response, that immediate response should not be taken seriously. Even as we speak, uh, that's why I'm looking at my uh, phone, for not because I invested uh, pretty much the family the jewel in uh, the uh, U.S. stock market, um, but uh, the NASDAQ is losing 2.5% uh, and the Dow is, is down 1.7% uh, on, on a low day, on a bad day, okay? Uh, so th things should not be happening today. Now, wh why is that interesting? So the market are telling us that they don't know, and we should uh, take them seriously. But uh, we should take them seriously by um, looking at some structural and fundamental factors that are going on. In June 2019, this will be the longest expansion of the U.S. economy on record, longest ever, since we keep record of the business cycle, okay? So now, imagine that you, wanted to be, uh, you don't want to be a sophisticated economist, you just want to be go by a very pure statistical rule. You should sit out right now and say, look, a recession is likely. Why likely? Just because we're hitting a record. So it's, it, we are unsure about how long that, that, uh, that will be. What are the factors that uh, uh, should make you concerned? Which are the factors that the markets are capturing one day more than others? Okay. Two, things, two, two things have changed since uh, the latest uh, recession. We sit, uh, we as the U.S. economy, in this case, I, I put myself on the, seat, on the U.S. economy seat right now, we're, we're sitting on a, a pile of debt that is unprecedented. Unprecedented means that uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the Great uh, Recession, the U.S. economy had uh, pretty much a public debt that was in the order of a little bit below 60% of GDP, and today is w cruising well above 103%. All of it is sustainable insofar uh, the U.S. economy is uh, thriving, like it is today. So it's in a big expansion, you know, the latest reading on GDP. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, this is something that I mentioned in class, so I see some of familiar faces here. I'm going to repeat it again. But, you know, the latest reading uh, in terms of GDP growth of the U.S. economy is appalling for how good it is. But markets are concerned not about the past, they're concerned about the future. So now think about it. You know that uh, you're about to face uh, uh, the, the chances of a recession are nothing major. Eh? We're talking about a recession in, in of the type of that we witnessed in 2001, from March uh, through September 2001, before 9-11, pretty much, okay? Uh, so we're witnessing at that. At the same time, uh, so, so we expect the recession to be coming. You know that the Fed is uh, made it very clear that uh, they are on a hike trail, so they, are, they will keep on increasing the rates for a good uh, year to come. And you know that the U.S. federal debt is as high as it has never been before. Well, I mean, growth is not, doesn't look good. I have a lot of debt and the rates are going up. Not the greatest time to be. Add to that uh, political uncertainty of the most uh, obvious uh, kind, okay? So this is just uh, for, for the possibly for the non-Americans, but even some, some of the Americans don't know that. No, we have the sense that the president is, is proposing a budgetary plan like, uh, like it happens in the U.S., where the, the prime minister of, uh, you know, is actually proposing a budgetary plan and that parliament approves. In Congress, it's not like that. You know, your fiscal plan, you know, so the president makes a, a grand statement, typically about, we're going to do this and that, and then Congress has to manage that, actually has to uh, uh, pro propose the law, and, uh, of course, there's a lot of soft power going on, as you may, might imagine, but the Congress is in, is in charge of that process. That was already complicated when we had a 
Congress align with the administration in terms of uh, political color. They were both Republican. What about a Congress now where the lower house is a Democrat? What we should we obs uh, expect? And of course, if you ask yourself that question, you understand that. Rates are rising. Debt uh, is, uh, is a lot. Growth is declining. And if I ask you to make a prediction regarding the next economic policy of the US, you know that trouble is coming your way. You know that there's a lot of uncertainty. If nothing else, you don't know what's going on because you're going to have a president pushing and claiming some very major step because the recession is looming out there. And at the same time, uh, Congress, which will make its best to show that uh, the president plan is inadequate, uh, that the US economy needs more. And so you look at that as a market participant and you say, of course, you know, this is perfect. This is the time where you have to pull out, you know, relax, lower your stake, just, just in case. It's a just in case statement. So what the government, what the, to the bottom line is that what the markets are telling us are now is a very simple thing. It's just, uh, let's wait, let's wait and see. Okay, just because uh, all the ingredients for a uh, uh, diminishing outcome are, are there. Okay, so the conclusion from the economics perspective is that now's a good time to short the U.S., right? Um, oh, oh, actually, <laughs> not right. No, that's, that's, it's, it's a very fair point, but it's not the right time. You know, this is not the, the moment where, where market short. This is the, the moment when market wait. The moment when market short is the middle of 2019, okay? Because, you know, and you know, honestly, this is actually a serious point. Uh, for once, uh, <laughs> short positions are expensive, as Eric knows very well. And you know, if you start too soon, you burn your money. Okay, now we're, we're too soon. now we're like everyone is like you talk to the consensus is is the, econ the, the U.S. economy experiencing uh, uh, out what you know people ask uh, this is an amazing question that I love. So, uh, um, do you expect the U.S. economy to enter a recession? And people say yes. When? And people say. Mm within 20, uh, by 2020, which means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing because by 2020 means uh, that uh, this is pa you, you're not saying whether this expansion will hit the record, will exceed the record, will not, will go into 2020. You're saying absolutely nothing. So I switch. Another nothing. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we can wait. We can hold our breath in economic terms. But, but can we hold our breath uh, on the Supreme Court, John had raised the issue of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, is the court really what we should be watching instead of the markets, David? Well, if we should be, we not only is Ginsburg 85, but Stephen Breyer is 80. And um, the Senate is all that counts in terms of the court. And even if the Democrats do very well in the recounts, it's 5149. It matters if it's 5149 or 5446, because as we saw with the Kavanaugh appointment, with 5149, as Susan Collins has leverage, Elisa Murkowski has leverage, and uh, Mitt Romney in the new Senate will have, will have leverage. So if it's close, it might. But my bet would be that Trump has a free hand on the court, and he'll have two more seats in the next two years, most likely. Um, let me take that as an excuse to segue into the Constitution. There was a, a warm response uh, from the audience. <laughs> Eric said he didn't know exactly who I was or what I was, but it's truly one of my main interests is the U.S. Constitution. It's the subject of my uh, emergency state course at all. And the elephant in the room here that we don't talk about but is so obviously overbearing on this is that we don't have majority rule in America. We have minority rule in America. That a majority of people who voted for president voted for Hillary. Majority of people who voted for the Senate voted for Democrats, yet the Democrats didn't control the Senate after either of those elections. The House, they finally do control in line with their majority, but gerrymandering sort of defeats majority rule there. That, uh, and we've seen for the now for five times in American history, people have gone to, presidents have gone to the White House by the constitutional system who have lost the popular vote. America does not vote by population, it votes by states, it votes by territories. Why is that? Not an accident. It's a very deliberate system. And I think if we think about the European Union, it might shed some light on it. What America had to do in the Constitutional Convention is go from a confederation of sovereign states into a more or less federal central government. And to do that, to get the assent of the sovereign states to that, it had to make some compromises. And some of those compromises were protecting the interest of slaveholders and slave states from the majority of non-slave states, 
protecting the interests of agrarians from merchant interests in other states, protecting simply small states, qua small states. Oh, we don't want Virginia and Massachusetts to run the whole government if, if we're going to join it, if Delaware is going to join it, if Rhode Island is going to join it. Okay, so they made some messy compromises, which we have lived with for 230, 240 years. Those are the rules of the game, and frankly, although five candidates for president won popular vote and didn't get in there, I haven't seen any serious moves by either major party to change that system, to change the electoral college system. And it would be hard. It would be even harder than impeaching President Trump because there's two methods of amending that part of the Constitution. One is a convention called by two-thirds of the states. The other, more common one, is a vote by both two-thirds of both houses of Congress, then ratified by three-quarters of the states. 38 states would have to ratify a change to the Electoral College, and 30-some-odd states benefit from the disproportion in favor of small states. So it just isn't going to happen. So the practical strategists in both parties play the game by the rules that are given, whether they like those rules or not, because they can't change those rules. And I think that one thing that 2016 showed the Democrats, and which is a ground for hope in 2018, 2016 showed the Democrats they cannot win nationally without the blue collar working class and broad belt. That, that all of the identity rainbow parts of their coalition were fine. What I call the orphans of the rainbow were missing and it cost them. And the fact that they, they won statewide governorships in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, even Illinois, uh, which they had won in the presidential election, but still, in, in the core of the Rust Belt, the Democrats eked out statewide margins, which means if they can repeat that two years from now, they can win the electoral votes of that state, which would, which would actually make them the favorites in, in the presidential election of that year. So, John, it sounds like David is setting up the question that you said you were going to come back to, which is what should be the Democratic strategy moving forward, and is there a candidate who could actually lead the Democratic Party in the, in, in the next electoral cycle to, to some kind of competitive outcome against, uh, against what we know is, a, is, at least in campaigning terms, a very competitive, uh, competitive president? think about that question but it's to be a practical strategist as David said you really don't have much choice because no, the electoral college is not going to be changed in, in any time soon if ever I think then to repeat the premise of my uh, question the Democrats can win if they hold what Hillary won and add the these Rust Belt states including my own although I, it's a bit of a Pennsylvania is less of a Rust Belt state than you might think. You should go and visit sometime. <laughs> Pits Pittsburghers are very insulted when they, it's one of the most high-tech cities in the United States now. Um, the, rust is, the rust is where they take the tourists to see these old steel mills are sort of monuments now. And who can win back those three states? There's 276 votes right there. I think uh, Joe Biden, I think, is the man who comes to mind. And I think he has to be the he has to be number one on your list. Uh, he's the only problem is that he is probably not going to run. Uh, that's one big problem. Uh, and, and so, and not everybody likes him. But the the premise is there's no Obama on the horizon. I don't think, as attractive as they are as candidates, I don't think that uh, Elizabeth Warren is going to cut it. I don't think Cory Booker is going to cut it. I don't think uh, Kamala Harris is going to cut it. I, I, I strongly disagree with the op-ed today in the New York Times by someone called Steve Phillips, who's arguing, the, making the old argument that you've been hearing for 15 years now, that the Democrats have a democratic demographic advantage that you can rely on the, on the rainbow without the white working class, I, th I think that's wrong. Um, and I think it's, it's a, there's a moral question here too. I think the Democratic Party, by virtue of what, the, what it stands for and by virtue of its history and what it wants to be, has to reach out to that uh, essential component of its, of, its, uh, of its base in some way. 
So I guess I guess my the, the answer is I don't know. I mean, uh, who could take assuming that the latest I've heard is that, is that uh, Biden has family issues. Uh, he did not enjoy campaigning this time. He's he's 75 years old. Um, so I guess we're looking for someone who could fit that profile. But uh, and certain if he did run, I could be wrong. Maybe he maybe he will change his mind. You know, I don't love the guy. I, I, I don't think he's all that smart, frankly. You know? uh, but but there's a low bar. <laughs> there's a low bar. I'm glad you pointed that out. I think Obama would probably do everything he possibly could for. I think he would he would uh, put his heart and soul into getting Obama uh, to getting Biden elected. So uh, I think he he could win, but I wouldn't count on his running. Yeah, I guess my you know my I, I I see what you're saying. My problem is that I don't think that the machinery within the Democratic Party is something that that Joe Biden could win. I mean, I think within the Democratic Party, there are divisions that are deep enough and the rules are, are balanced enough that somebody could, just like Obama did to Hillary Clinton, take away the victory. And, and then we end up with a Democratic candidate that doesn't appeal. And, and just to put some numbers on this, right, I mean, 60 percent, 60 percent of, uh, of uh, white men who did not go, did not complete university voted Republican, right? Um, and and the, the, you, cannot, you cannot win without that constituency. You can't win if you lose that large of a constituency. And, and, and as we move through the different things like gun owner households and, you know, you can, it's the identikit of the rural voter. And I don't say that as somebody who, who, who disparages that community. I'm saying it because there are so many powerful overlapping cleavages that you have to be able to reach into, and, and, I, and I don't see a Cory Booker or a Kamala Harris being able to, to go out and say, well, I really, you know, I really want to go duck hunting with you. Where are we going to go, right? I just, you know, and, and unfortunately, I don't know how you win an election without that, right? I mean, you know, this is one thing that Hillary was, was good at, was duck hunting, right? Sure. Um, I have a theory about those uh, white men who didn't finish college that uh, some of you have heard before. Uh, why do I refer to them as orphans of the rainbow? That for the past two decades, real wages for everybody, every demographic except the ultra-rich, have been stagnating. So that politicians haven't been promising rising real incomes, living standards, end of precarity, upward mobility. They can't, right? So they've been promising what they can promise to various rainbow groups legalization for marriage equality, DACA. Like you, can, you, can, you can offer legal remedies to groups. White males don't need legal remedies. The legal system favors them. It was written by them. It's biased in their favor. Also, older white married women, don't, that's not going to appeal to them. The I agree the Democrats need that demographic. If they're going to get that demographic, it's by doing what they used to do in the days of FDR and Truman and Lyndon Johnson, which is credibly promise concrete economic gains. Now, I happen to think that anyone who's going to turn 80 in the White House, assuming two terms, should be off the list. Even Reagan was 79. Even Bernie when he Sanders? Left. Yes. Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, off my list. I agree that Elizabeth Warren is not a viable candidate. I think Kamala Harris is not a viable candidate. I'm sure Cory Booker is not a viable candidate. But Look at Beto O'Rourke, who we were looking at before. Who ever heard of him before? He did so well because he had a program which he energetically sold people on. So although the W. Bush presidency and the Obama presidency should have taught us a few lessons about putting inexperienced people in the White House, we may have to look to that because the experienced people are too old and their ideas are too old. So the thing is, the Democrats control the House. They control the hearings process. They can have televised hearings. They can ask Mike Pompeo, what's the deal with Kim Jong-un and the Korean nukes? They can ask Gina Haspel, what do we know about Khashoggi? We can create names. We can create <coughs> stars. But we must create content. We must create content. content.
Okay, Justin, I see, I, I see your hand up, but I'm, and I'm going to bring you in, but just, just a point to note, 52% of the households that had over $100,000 in income voted Republican, right? So, so it's not that poor people were voting Republican. The people that were voting Republican were wealthy relative to the society as a whole. 63% of the population with an income of under $35,000 a year voted Democrat. So, so in, in that sense, I don't think, uh, you know, it's, it's harder to make the argument that we've lost the, the poor working class, um, unless we want to define the poor working class as those people who are making over $100,000 a year, um, which, is, which is possible, um, but, but, but it, is a, it, it is a more challenging argument to make. Anyway, Justin. I wanted to connect to some of the things that, um, that David was saying about the, the origins of the, of, the, uh, of the American Constitution and, and its constitutional system. Uh, he's absolutely right. There's, uh, there's absolutely no way that the, the Electoral College is going to be, is going to be amended. It's, it's basically impossible with the, with, the, with the numbers that are needed to, to, to amend the American Constitution. But this, in a way, and I'm saying, I want, I'd like to underline this as, as, an, as an observation by a non-American for a second and as a constitutional, uh, as a comparative constitutionalist. This is making the United States ever more an outlier from a constitutional perspective because it really does show how peculiar, in many respects, the American constitutional system has become. For example, the, Amer the, the presidential debate uh, 2016, it would have been unheard of in any other country to have, to have uh, listened to presidential candidates talking about who they were going to appoint to the Supreme Court. A complete break with any idea of, prin of a principle of separation of powers and so on and so forth. Philippe was la <laughs> laughing at the end. I mean, can you imagine if we, if we had an electoral campaign where we had parties saying we want Tizio Caio or Sempronio in the, in the constitutional court? So literally, As talking about the might idea, have, but I think yeah, literally talking about the idea of packing the court. And you're right, obviously, and we, we knew this not by chance, the presidential debate of 2016 concentrated so much on the Supreme Court because it's simply a question of the age of, of, of the judges. I mean, uh, some of you, I went on the BBC uh, website this morning. There are people praying for uh, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg to live for another two years. There's people saying that they will, they will give all their ribs to help her out and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a, there's a campaign going on. Do, there's somebody else, do not die on us now. Sort of thing. I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's no doubt that Trump has a unique opportunity of packing the court. But here again, this is also the unusual role of the U.S. Supreme Court in many ways. The, the, the fact that we, we, we talk about the Supreme Court as though it was a mini, it was a mini Congress where we talk about five, four majorities and so on and so forth, and, um, and we cannot deny that it's completely and utterly politically influenced, which, of course, a constitutional or Supreme Court should not really be. That's what at least we try to tell those countries when we're giving them advice on the adopting a new constitution and so on and so forth. I mean, the very electoral college has been abandoned by all other countries. I think Argentina had it until some decades ago, but I don't think there's any other country in the world now with a presidential form of government that uses the electoral college. Obviously, the reasons for that electoral college being adopted is, as David underlined, a com a compensation between federalism and democracy fundamentally. Okay, it's a balance between these two things. I want to I, I want to come back to this point that David made because I I, I do buy the argument to a, to a large extent that there's a, a big part of the working class that's been left behind and that needs to be addressed. But but Filippo, you you've been engaged in center left politics. Is there anything we can do for this huge chunk of the working class that needs to be addressed? I mean, we can make promises that their life is going to get better, but but can we deliver on those promises with uh, with anything like uh, the the weird mix of structural reforms and, and moderate stimulus, or or are, are all these promises just empty? Which is, I, I guess, a question that could probably be addressed to the five star movement as well. Now, if you want to leverage my uh, own mistakes to try to give suggestions for uh, U.S. politics, I will refrain from that. But there is actually a, a structural point uh, that, uh, that I'd like to raise. And I'm going to use the example of Pennsylvania, which I, I understand you guys like very much. Uh, so, no, but, you know, I, I look, I, I use Pennsylvania because it's a very telling um, example. So, Pennsylvania is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting state because, uh, you know, politically speaking, I was just checking my, my, my color map from the New York Times a, a few minutes ago, and, you know, where you had a uh, uh, different uh, flip, 
toward the Democrats, in particular, you know, west of Philadelphia, north of Pittsburgh, you know. So, and it's interesting because uh, if uh, now, if I'm not saying anything wrong, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Pennsylvania turned uh, Republican for the first, in the presidential election, last presidential election, uh, uh, the first time since 1988, right? Uh, so Bush uh, senior, I think, it always voted a Democrat. So it's an interesting state, right? It's an interesting state because uh, the political, you know, it, it, it's, it's swinging, it's the end of the Rust Belt, it's pretty much a good representation of the, of the structural transformation that uh, uh, the US economy underwent uh, through. What's interesting about Pennsylvania is this. You look at any indicator of Pennsylvania, you say, my God, that's a, by any European standard is a success. Employment up, average income up, salary up, everything is, is nice, but, Precisely for the reason that uh, um, uh, John uh, mentioned, Pennsylvania is also, is also a state, like few other in the, in the US, where you had a major shift in the kind of jobs that you had. So it's a traditionally relatively more manufacturing intensive by US standard, and it turned toward the more toward the service sector. It's actually more advanced, you know, more advanced, no, advanced is a bad word. It's more uh, technology leaning, you know, in more new economy. Which, is all, which all sounds very cool, but may I now think about the perception of uh, the um, average middle-class American, okay? I don't know whether white or not, but in fact, middle-class American, okay? And uh, we look at uh, this, uh, this, uh, this individual and, uh, and the household. This is somebody that was used to a certain stability. With it. I mean, manufacturing job, maybe they suck to a different uh, dimension, but they give you stability, they give you protection, they give you health insurance for yourself, your family. I mean, a bunch of social rights that you hold uh, dear. Now, you lose your job in those sectors, and you start finding uh, a job in one of these uh, service economy, okay, in the information technology, which once again seems interesting if you're maybe in your 30s, but if you're in your late 40s, early 50s, you have a you have a household to take care of, you know, you start getting worried. You have a job, it's, you're not unemployed. You look at the statistics, unemployment is low, employment is high, income is going up, but you feel less secure. Now, does that bite into your perception and your political inclination and also your political vote? Of course it does. I mean, and I think, uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, wisely enough, during his campaign, uh, there is, a, there is an, um, uh, an amazing speech that you, uh, I suggest you go and find online by President Trump on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania, where he makes this you know, statement about uh, uh, bringing jobs where the people are, which is fun. It's, it's, it's an it, it actually talks to, these, uh, to the concern of these people. Because you know, if you move from a more stable sector into a more volatile one, your perception, your worry is that you're going to lose your job sooner or later. So how do I reassure you as, as, as a policymaker or as a politician? I tell you, look, you guys are concerned about your, have your job in some uncertain uh, sector. You know what, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I, I use uh, taxpayer money, I use public spending to actually do something that cannot be taken away from you. Jobs that you cannot absolutely outsource. And what jobs, are, what kind of jobs are those? The jobs that you cannot take away from a certain landed territory. Infrastructure, beautiful, you know. You know, now imagine that you talk, and that's the only credible promise you can make, by the way, okay? In, a, in, a, in, an, in an economy and in a social um, uh, uh, texture that underwent through a major transformation of, of the economy, the only really credible and reassuring statement you can make is, you guys concern about the state, the, the, the state of your infrastructure, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rebuild it. I'm gonna use taxpayer money to actually put it there in an effort to support it, and then I make a statement about uh, supporting the overall economy and blah, blah, blah. But really, what I'm telling you is job where you are and for an extended period of time, and jobs that nobody can take away from you. Okay? And in that way, I, I, I provide you the reassurance with some degree of credibility. Problem is that you could make that statement with that kind of Congress. Can you make a, a, an equivalent statement now? And, and most importantly, are the Democrats gonna buy to that uh, statement? Are they going to support that kind of approach uh, of uh, let's revive uh, uh, decayed US infrastructure through the funding of uh, taxpayer money? And if they do, will they, will they be leader or follower in the political process? And of course, all of these are rhetorical questions. So, David, is that the kind of answer you were hoping for, for, for the orphans of the rainbow? I was hoping for something a lot bolder, actually. Um, I, 
we know that history doesn't repeat itself because even if it literally plays out the same dramas of demagogy, nationalism, genocide, it does it in a changing international context. So it doesn't repeat itself. But historians increasingly find it uncanny to compare the present period with the period between the two world wars in Europe and in America, where you had discredited liberal elites, where you had economic problems of precarity and unemployment that nobody seemed to have answers to, and you had demagogues with instant answers stepping up. And I think that it's, it's too easy to say, I don't want to challenge Filippo in economics, it's his specialty, but it's too easy to say that infrastructure is the only kinds of jobs that could do that. Why is infrastructure the only kind of jobs that do that? Because, as he said, others are vulnerable to outsourcing. Well, the profitability of outsourcing depends on tax and regulatory treatment. It depends on supply chains. Supply chains have been moved already as a result of Trump's protectionism. I say to the Democrats, if you're not bold enough to look beyond narrow increments in infrastructure, you're committing suicide. Look where it's going. Look at where desperate people are turning. You can't save the liberal order, the liberal international order, and the liberal trading order with cautious steps anymore. We had, in the, in, as a response to that crisis of the interwar years, we had from the end of World War II on a very deliberate process of income pr compression, of creating equality. It was driven by government policies. It could not have happened in a more globalized, more openly trading world. It could only have happened in the world that existed in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, but it was effective. And for the past 35 years, we've not only seen a growth in inequality, we've seen systematic policies adopted in every Western democracy that favor that inequality. Keep that up. I think I see where it's going. I think I don't like it. Get summon up some courage, be bold, look for more than infrastructure. So, John, are you going to help us out here? Because sure. <clears throat> uh, overhaul, start with uh, single-payer health care. I mean, that should be on, it seems to me, on the Democratic, whoever the, whoever the, uh, whoever the candidate is, ought to, ought to bite the bullet and, and say this is what we stand for. And let's just, uh, I mean, is the white working class in the United States really opposed to socialized medicine? I, I don't think so. I mean, they, they've been brainwashed to think anything that, any word that, anytime there's the adjective socialism, uh, that, that it's wrong or bad. Trump, by the way, has already announced that he's going to be, socialism will be a big issue in 2020, assuming he runs. Because I think he sees that this is potentially a serious argument that can be made, uh, you, you, be used against him. Uh, that his, his tax cut has you know, overhauled the tax system. Reverse these, uh, roll back the damage that Trump has done. Uh, point out to the working class, white working class who votes for Trump that he has done absolutely nothing for you uh, in terms of economic, of what he promised. He's feeding you this steady diet of, of, uh, of cultural anxiety. I mean, call it racism and call it ethnocentrism that he's increasingly rely, relying on that because he hasn't delivered anything economically. So I think the Democrats should be for, I mean, what's wrong with socialized medicine? I think we, in the United States, explain to people that the military has socialized medicine, right, John? You, you, you live under a socialist health regime. <laughs> uh, why shouldn't everybody? I mean, why the people like me over 65 are, uh, have socialized medicine, uh, people who, uh, our indigent have socialized medicine. We have socialized police protection in the United States. We have socialized primary education. What's more important than providing for the, the you know, for the, uh, the health and well-being of the, the working public and the, work, and the people who produce uh, income? I think, can, can, it, can it be explained to people in those terms? It seems to me that they would buy it. Um, don't, you know, by all means, don't use socialism. <laughs> think of something else. So a single payer, but <laughs> but I, I think uh, I, th I think the polls show that people are ready for that. They, they will support it. Uh, they would support a Canadian system or the, uh, something along those lines. Uh, so I think that's if you want. Uh, is it really bold in this day and age to suggest that? I guess in the U.S. context, it is. But uh, 
Okay, now I, I, I do have one eager member of the audience who'd like to uh, like to jump in. If you could just identify yourself for us, please. Uh, uh, just a factual point uh, for the audience. I'm a Canadian, so uh, we live with an elephant next door. <laughs> okay, I have lots of uh, questions for what is a really interesting and provocative panel. So thank you all very much. But just a a point about uh, healthcare systems. Um, for many years, I um, focused on healthcare financing, so I speak with a little bit of authority here, <laughs> although my knowledge is a bit out of date. But it is the case that a greater proportion of healthcare costs in the United States is covered by government than in Canada, even though Canada is labeled as a country with socialized medicine. It actually is just a single payer system, okay? And why is that the case? For the reasons you've mentioned, uh, Professor Harper, when you add up TRICARE, which is the military health care system and the government health care system, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, all of the federal and state employees, and all of the special programs, everything from, uh, you know, pregnant women health care to kidney dialysis, which is free, uh, you actually have a greater proportion of health care costs that are covered by the government in the United States than you do in Canada. The kicker is that the American system costs a lot more, that the administrative costs are almost double what they are in Canada. So not only do you have a myth of having a private health care system, but you're paying a lot for it. Okay, so that's my factual point. Uh, I will hold off my question, though, and let somebody else... Okay, I do want to I do want to bring Justin in uh, because because John made this uh, Professor Harper made this this very interesting aside where he said you know assuming he runs uh, and uh, about Trump and I guess my question for you Justin is uh, is Trump in more legal jeopardy if he stays in office or if he leaves office uh, and, and indeed what uh, what kind of legal jeopardy does he face uh, now that the the House is full of Democrats who have subpoena powers and can do investigations, or, or, or is that just more fact-finding and not, uh, not a, a, a legally consequential uh, activity per se? Well, certainly, no, uh, interesting question. Certainly, as, uh, as, uh, as long as he remains president of the United States, then these investigations have to go through Article 2, Section 4 of the of the of the of the American Constitution, so he has a he has a form of protection as head of state and head of government of the United States that he he wouldn't have if he uh, if he stepped down as as, as president. So here, that, that, okay, here we, we're close to home. Filippo Filippo and I think this sounds uh, vaguely vaguely familiar. Okay, uh, one wonders whether. Uh, Trump is uh, will will be thinking about running again for office also because it, g it gives him some form of of extra protection with respect to 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 him being out of office. H however, I'm I'm not convinced that Trump is thinking about that. I don't think I think I don't know I, here. I don't want to do an analysis of the of the character and so on and so forth. But I just I can't imagine. Trump stepping down anyway from from the presidency. He wants he wants another shot in 2020, and he wants to prove that that the the, the victory in, in 2016 was not a fluke. And uh, I think my personal opinion, you, I mean, you've all been commenting on the results of these elections. I think there have been some positive things for the Democrats. If we see this dynamically, I think this could build up to a victory in the presidential elections in 2020, but it's, it's going to be fundamental who the presidential candidate is, and we are two years away from the, from the elections and we still don't have a candidate, and I, I think that is uh, an issue in many ways. But the, that so-called blue wave that some people were talking about is not there, in my opinion. I mean, I think, uh, coming back to some of the things that were said earlier on and by you, Eric, in your introduction, I mean, I think both both parties played a lot on the issue of turnout. This has become an important issue, and I, this is not this is not an unique to the United States. I think this is happening in a lot of other countries now. As voter turnout tends to go down, we realise that what becomes important is making sure your people go to vote, 
and they go out in high numbers, and that's a way of, of winning the election rather than the old way of, of doing things, i.e. trying to win the centrist moderate uh, votes. Okay, do you want to, uh, just real quick, and then we'll go to the audience? Yes, I promise okay. you, super quick. So, you want to make a rational and actually constructive argument? Yes. Uh, the United States spend uh, on for health, including private and public spending combined together, between 13 and 14 percent of GDP, which is outrageous. To give you just the same uh, figure, for Germany, we're talking about 9 percent. Italy, 8.5 percent. France, 9 percent. You want to campaign saying that uh, you want to make uh, the uh, system, uh, the, the U.S. system, uh, health system, more equitable, cheaper, more Canadian, be my guest, it's political suicide. Because my response to that will be the following, said, what you're talking about is more taxes for the middle class. So you want to tax the, uh, the hell out of the middle class by imposing this extra thing. And you, of course you'll have to run and say, ah, make this sophisticated argument about uh, uh, the fact that right now the US is spending more than others, uh, uh, but it's ridiculous. I will talk about socialism to you all the way, taxation and socialism all the way. And on top of that, I will go for the final kill, which is, which is the, f I th look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sophisticated guy, but I think President Trump is smarter than me in campaigning, okay? And he will t finally tell, look at you and say, or any Republican say, look, these people want to tax you and keep you in your lousy job that can be taken away from you at any point uh, through outsourcing because they don't protect you. I give you the job. It's a job for real. It stays there. You cannot take it away from you. Honestly, I don't, I don't understand how you can win rhetorically with that argument. Then, you know, is, is, it, is it rational argument? Is it good? I don't, no, it's not, but I think it's very powerful in terms of rhetoric. So I uh, have uh, my uh, highest hope for the Democrats coming up with better arguments, but uh, if I might uh, suggest, uh, make, a, make, a, make a suggestion, I think that just advocating uh, extension of uh, uh, Medicaid and Medicare or socializing uh, health uh, like in the military, that, you know, that won't give you the... <coughs> All right, guys. Now it's your turn. Do you have any questions? Yeah, all the way in the back, if we could. If you could please just uh, indicate who you are so that I can keep track of the question flow. Hi, I'm William Booth. I teach Latin American politics here. Um, it's clearly a very divisive discussion, albeit it's been done in very polite terms, but people are coming up with very different ideas about what direction things should go in. I think that reveals one of the big problems here, which is the Democrats. Um, in 2016, it should not have been that difficult to beat Trump. I mean, he's a terrible candidate, a terrible person, and <laughs> how did that happen? One reason it happened was that the Democrat Party, Democratic Party is very divided, uh, as the primaries really showed. I think there's a very clear Capitol Hill centrist faction that doesn't want to change much, and there's clearly a push to the left at the moment as well. Uh, and how do you reconcile that? I'm not sure you can, actually. Um, Beto O'Rourke kind of did reconcile those two bits of, of the Democratic Party in Texas. Uh, he had a pretty progressive platform uh, and came very close to winning. Um, so I wonder whether they could be a bit bolder. I, 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 I think they're pushing against an open door with Medicare for all. 54% of Republicans support it. I don't think that's, that's going to be very difficult to convert into a victory. I think they should win in 2020, but they need to be a coherent party with a coherent ideology. Um, they can't give an inch on xenophobia. I think that's a moral point. And if they triangulate with this nonsense on the threat of immigrant caravans and, and so on, that's a complete dereliction of political duty. Um, so I think they do have to make a positive offer, as you're saying, Philippe, by, you know, uh, some jobs and infrastructure is good, Medicare for is good. I think they n now they've got the House, they need to push voting reform. Uh, this, uh, I don't think that's necessarily been mentioned, but they could, w if they were fair voting in three or four more states, they'd win easily in 2020. Voter suppression is an absolute obscenity in the US, and, that, and that they need to just hammer that. I know they can't do that much about it at federal level, but they've got both parts of state legislatures in, in many states where this is an issue and they need to fix it and they need to get 
religion about gerrymandering as well. So uh, I think there's a lot of things that the Democratic Party could do if they acted more like a coherent unit and really push this stuff. But I mean, do you do you see that happening? Do you do you see the same divide that I do in the Democratic Party? That's actually a really good question, but I but I, I do want to get a couple of questions before I give it back to this talky talky panel. Uh, so yeah. My name is Umberto from Ohio. Uh, question for Professor Harper. Given the uh, map of the Rust Belt, uh, you assumed that given last week's results, Ohio would stay Republican in 2020. And they did last week. The statewide elections were swept by Republicans for the uh, third cycle in a row. But Sherrod Brown was the lone Democrat who actually excelled and won rather easily. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Sherrod Brown as a national candidate and if you're your theory is that if they win back those couple Rust Belt states, they win easily. Wouldn't Sherrod Brown get the job done just with that? Okay. Will the Democrats stay divided? Will Ohio go uh, stay Republican? Can I get one more? Uh, yeah, right here. Hi, Sorry, I'm John. I'll get back to you in a bit. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm from New York. Um, we talked about the um, potential Democratic candidates in 2020, but there have been some um, rumors about Republican candidates challenging Trump in the primaries. I'm curious what the panel thinks of, A, if that's even possible, um, B, who do you think would be a candidate that could potentially beat Trump in the primaries? All right, so will the Democrats stay divided? Will <laughs> Ohio stay Republican? And, and will the Republicans stay united? I think that's a, a balanced triptych. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so what I propose is I'm going to start with Justin and then, and then just run down. Uh, you guys don't have to answer all the questions, but, but I can't imagine missing an opportunity to speak. William, okay. Um, how you began, I completely disagree in a sense. Okay, I know we're, t we're, we're talking in this room, but this is where I think the elections were lost in 2016 by defining Donald Trump as a terrible candidate and a terrible person, okay? I consider Roger Cohen of the New York Times as one of those responsible for Trump winning with his continual attempt at character assassination. Once you've got the candidate running, it's, it is suicide to, uh, to try and do a smear campaign in this way because that's one of the reasons why uh, the, 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 the presidential elections of 2016 became so div div divisive and became a black and white election with people either pro-Trump or against Trump. And I think that needs to be avoided because we shouldn't forget that Trump benefited a heck of a lot from, from bad press. He, the, the old idea, it's better they talk about me and they, they criticize me rather than not talking about me at all. And in part, I think that helped, the, I think that helped his campaign and one of the reasons why he won. Having said that, I completely agree with you on the issue that has not come up so far of, re, of, of voting reform at state level. That is something that is, it's, it's, it's also very difficult, uh, but it's not as difficult as amending the Constitution and so on, and that's something that really should become an issue and something that the Democrats should be working on, because I'm not going to list you them, I'm sure you're all familiar, but we've had loads of cases of voting uh, suppression uh, across states in the United States, from Georgia, and, and so on and so forth, and this is something that needs to be needs to be addressed. And again, I know I'm a broken record, but this is another case where the United States is becoming an outlier with regard to, to the voting rules. Because the way that voters are registered in the United States is the most antiquated, and if I may, I'm going to be polemical, but it's the most undemocratic way of dealing with voter registration that you can see in any consolidated democracy. It shouldn't be like that. And for once, maybe the United States and the Democrats in particular could learn from looking how it works elsewhere. Well, fortunately, Justin, the, the new Supreme Court will make all those voting rights cases go That's away. Right. <laughs> John. Well, very quick answers to some of these. You can't blame Roger Cohen because no one who voted for, for, for Trump reads the New York Times. <laughs> that's true, that's you know, true, John, that's true. You, you, bla you have to blame, you know who you have to blame is Hillary Clinton. That was a winnable election, I, I agree with you. Hillary Clinton was, was a, a terrible candidate, I'm sorry, I voted for her. 
But she, she was the perfect target, the perfect foil for Trump and for his, uh, the deplorables, people turned that into a slogan. They put that on t-shirts. They wore that. That became a battle cry. We are the deplorables. You know, this, she was the, she was a loser. Obama would have wiped Trump off the, off the face of the earth. He would, he, knows that he would have won easily, I think. So I think it, it has a lot to do with contingent factors. This is a fascinating question to talk about, uh, the 2016 election, and to what extent were the long-term secular uh, causes and to what extent were there, were there immediate contingent factors that might have been different. I think one should not underestimate the latter. On the on the Ohio, I don't know much about Sherrod Brown, but I think somebody like that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's just the kind. He has just the sort of profile that uh, that you need, and presumably he would take back Ohio. So you wouldn't need, uh, you could afford to lose Pennsylvania or or uh, Michigan. Um, on the, your your question is interesting about the Republicans. There's a lot of talk about how Trump has taken over the Republican Party as if it was a corporation. You know, he's he has just it's, it's his. He's locked it up. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think the Republican establishment has cynically used him, McConnell and company. Uh, they've seen that he's popular. They've used him to get what they want, his tax cut. Uh, the um, evangelical uh, community have held their nose and cynically used him, supported him to get what they want, which is people on the Supreme Court who will challenge Roe versus Wade and, and chip away. Uh, so various, but I think the Republicans would abandon him if, if it depends on Mueller. If there's if there's stuff there that's embarrassing, if there's if there are things that look like smoking guns, then I think he will be challenged. Uh, Nikki Haley is waiting in the wings. She said, of course, the first thing she said, right, Ian, you're the first person who told me this. Of course, the first thing she. When she's in the White House and you uh, you stick a mic in her face and that you ask her, next, if she's sitting next to Trump, are you running in 2020? What do you expect her to say? But I, I have no I have no doubt that she's waiting for the possible opportunity, and other people are too. So the whole Trump thing, could, you know, it would not rule out the the possibility that Trump is history. In uh, this may sound like wishful thinking, but uh, remember anyone who remembers the the story of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon won by a landslide in 1972. He was really at the height of his power. He had he had everything, but and two years later he was, you know, getting on that helicopter and heading to California. Well, just to reassure you, John, Mark Penn has uh, has, has already suggested Hillary is going to run again in 2020. <laughs> um, David, divisions within the two parties. Um, Yes, there's big divisions within the Democratic Party. There's big difference between Senator Joe Manchin and Representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, obviously. Not just because it's a big tent party, but because there's a struggle going on in the party. There is an organization. There's a DNC. There's a senatorial campaign committee. There's a House campaign committee that doles out campaign funds, that selects candidates, that has sometimes lost to insurgencies, but has the upper hand organizationally. The energy, the momentum, is with the leftward movement in the Democratic Party. The control, the organization, was with the rightward move. That will simply have to be fought out. Should the Democrats, I think that the Democrats wasted uh, a lot of opportunities in the last two years by talking Trump, 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 Mueller, 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 Putin, Comey, hoping that it was all a bad dream and it would go away. It's not gonna go away. The numbers are going to shift marginally one or the other. There's a real issue out there. The Democrats have lost credit with a lot of their former voters. They need to work to get them back, and they don't do it by talking about Trump. On the Republican side, I think it's a very different picture. I think it, it's not McConnell and company. It's just McConnell. Ryan's gone. Rince Priebus is gone. Elliot Cohn is gone. The, the Republican Party, as we knew it, isn't there. Trump has sole ownership of it. He's the only vehicle, and they know it, that can get them to win elections in this, in this context. That the constituency for the limited government, tax cut, whatever stuff uh, Jeb Bush ran on, that kind of stuff, it just isn't there. After a number of successes in electoral cycles, it just fell flat in 2016. People on the Republican side are just as discontented with the status quo 
That's people on the Democratic side. They want something different. Trump is the only one speaking to it. Of course accidents can happen. Health accidents can happen. Anything can happen. But let's, let's just uh, assume that Trump is there and let's talk about what Democrats would do. So just a little advertisement for those of you who don't know. We actually have an old school Republican woman named Corey Shockey coming in on Wednesday in the middle of the day. And she's not just a foreign policy professional of a very high level, uh, but, but she's very engaged in party political activity. So if you want to want to challenge this assertion that the old Republican Party has gone away, um, please do come and listen to Corey. She's, a, she's an outstanding public speaker who spoke to an SRO audience, standing room only audience in Washington uh, while I was there last week. Uh, Philippe? You know, just, just a comment. Um, I'm not going to get into the detail of uh, uh, Ohio politics because I don't know much uh, about it. But there is, you know, I just wanted to make a, a point uh, uh, about the structural change that's going on, you know, um, which, which is related to the way that you can win back the electorate. That's especially a problem for Democrats, but you know, uh, it, it's across the board. I'm going just to use, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, voters uh, some often have a perception about uh, what's going on, even if they can't uh, really explain it and, and vocalize it. And I think this is one of the cases. Uh, this is one of the cases. What's happening in the U.S. politics is actually one of these cases. There is a clear sense of a structural and irreversible transformation that is not being addressed by the party, the Democrats first, but should be dealing with that. And I'm going to use just a, a, a bit super quickly, you know, an argument that is not mine. You know, I'm just actually going to adopt an argument that is not mine. That comes from Richard Baldwin. Richard Baldwin wrote a, a very nice book, which I suggest you read, which is called The Great Convergence. He talks about uh, structural di technological disruption and structural break and whatever. The bottom line is the following. All our society, all our economy are built about around the first wave of globalization. What is the first wave of globalization? The cost of moving goods basically go, goes down to zero. So when uh, moving goods uh, cost nothing, what you do is that you centralize production and you trade with the rest of the world. Which means that if you have to organize society around it, the welfare state, it's very easy to do it. We all live together, so you have to provide social services or whatever you think uh, you should provide uh, to the same place. Second wave of globalization, second technological disruption. The one we live in today. It's not just costless to move uh, stuff around. Now it's also costless to move information around, which means that we don't need, if we work together, we don't need to be physically in the same place. We can <laughs> spread out. We can disarticulate production. This is what we all feel. This is the notion of outsourcing. What is outsourcing really? It's the notion that I, don't, I can work with David even if it's thousands of miles away. We create a global value chain. He does his thing, I do my thing. That's extremely worrying if you are uh, edu even an educated middle class person because you know that your job can be taken away from you. Now, what these people ask for protection. What kind of protection are you giving them? You know, if you look at the Rust Belt in the United States, this is the, the, this is the ground zero of that demand. It's actually the place, not, it's not the only place, but it's the number one place where this demand is growing. And look, let me be as forceful as you can, Unless you start uh, talking to that demand for protection, understanding that is something structural went on which is irreversible, or you're not talking at all to that. So that applies to also Ohio in particular, I guess. Okay, we've got time for a lightning round if there are one or two more questions out there. But we've been going on for a while, and I know we're running up against the hour. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, okay. Hi, my name is Lawrence Hopper. H O P P E R, not H R H A R P E R. Um, it seems to me I kind of agree with what you say, but kind of disagree with some other things. And I also want to add something to what uh, John Harper said. Uh, I think one positive that, that came out was the hundred um, ladies who got elected in Congress. I think that was very positive for the Democrats and also for the country as a whole. Um, as far as the 2020 election is concerned, I don't agree with any of your candidates. I'm looking at uh, Oprah. <laughs> and the reason why is because Oprah, first of all, she's an entertainer, so she knows how to talk to people, and she's very popular. And I think her Instagram account is probably bigger than the one of uh, Trump. So I, li I like her a lot. She's very, 
um, inclusive. She agrees with all the issues that we are all concerned about. She does a great job of communicating that. And I think she could bring the Democratic Party together more than anybody. But that's just my opinion. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Fiore. I'm from California. Um, so my question, though, would be around uh, what, I'm sorry, I can't see. Uh, Professor Unger uh, described uh, when you were speaking about the regulatory mechanisms that would, I mean, the interesting part is neoliberalism we often think is the retreat of the state, right? And so one of the questions that I kind of am interested in is the power of transnational corporations and the influence of corporate money, um, not only in terms of legislation in the U.S., but in terms of um, kind of promulgating deeply anti-labor and uh, minimal financial regulatory mechanisms. I just think of the case of, um, I don't know, remember which bank, HSBC, a number of years ago was fined for, um, for um, what was it, mm, like money laundering, like uh, drug tra money laundering through drug trafficking organizations, et cetera. But you, know, you couldn't really fine these organizations because they're too big to fail. So I was just wondering what what kinds of regulatory mechanisms could deal with this kind of transnational corporate power that doesn't care for nations. Okay, this, this gives us a, a, a cheery prospect to end on, whether it's going to be big entertainment versus big capital. Um, <coughs> uh, anybody want to have a closing remark? Just since that was addressed to me, I just want to respond to what, what I'm actually thinking there is is that there must be regulations at stake or K Street wouldn't be putting all that money into it that are late lamented trade agreements TPP and TIPP just like what used to be NAFTA and is now something else average length between 700 and 1200 pages you don't need 700 or 1200 pages to say there are going to be no tariffs or non-tariff barriers you need one page to say that What's on those other pages? Not free trade, protectionism. Protecting the interests that needed a particular piece of language, saying except for our international property rights, except for our oil deposits, except for the arrangement we made 10 years ago and want to keep. So while the state has retreated, and that is a problem in its capacity to respond to the crisis of the moment, there's still a lot in play. We can see it by the way they're playing. And just to bring that together, with the point I was making about the division of the Democratic Party. The organization of the Democratic Party, the DNC, tends to be the people who um, are in those closed rooms and favor those kind of trade agreements. Just a point uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, labor versus finance or finance versus labor. Just, this is actually, uh, the U.S. administration made uh, a policy out of necessity rather than out of uh, commitment or out of vision, which is always a problematic step uh, to do. It's, it's understandable, but it's, it's problematic. If you ask to the Federal Reserve people, uh, if, uh, if you talk to them before the financial crisis, they would all tell you, solution, break the banks, break them, too large, too large, split them, cut them, they're just too large uh, to, to manage. Of course, that policy was suddenly reversed during the Great Recession and uh, because precisely, you know, you had a lot of merge and a lot of uh, merge of different banks and, and stuff like that. Now, what was the natural consequence to that from the point of view of better policy? The natural consequence was, okay, look, given that you can't break the banks, you put a very heavy regulation on them, which is the opposite of what happened, okay? And it was, uh, it's exactly the opposite of what happened. Now, you can go there now and say uh, we, we're going to reverse that policy and, uh, and that's important because there is a, a systemic threat that this large institution poses on the, on, on the economy. And once again, that's a useful policy. And you will find a lot of support uh, with the people within the administration, the Treasury, and even the Federal Reserve. Is this, a, 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 is this an item where you can actually make a dent in any uh, political debate? I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised, unless you want to go 
super populist. So you, you do want to say something like, the problem is not regulation and well-functioning uh, US economy or US credit market, but it's really the big banks are bad because you know of this money they have and blah, blah, blah. By the way, in the, 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 the example that you made about HSBC that has been fined for money laundering is not a good example, allow me on that, because actually HSBC was uh, charged. And they, uh, was charged, they paid the fine because the fine was negligible compared to their balance sheet, right? It wasn't uh, that much financial. The problem is elsewhere. The problem is that when these uh, large financial institution, they pose, and even to they do it today, systemic threat on the stability of the US economy, okay? But once again, the, the, even as I say it, I get bored, okay? So imagine, <laughs> I mean, getting out of this room and actually trying to uh, make that a political campaign without uh, be go going a bit on the, Allow me, uh, just uh, one polemic trait. Going a bit of the, the Bernie Sanders way, you know, it's just on, on that front, it's really unconvincing to me. It's time for a new New Deal, Filippo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, things are gonna have to get a lot worse before we get there, unfortunately. But we can, we can talk back some of the stupidity which has been carried out under the, in the last 15 years. We, we can, we can, uh, or at least in the last uh, in the last uh, five, in terms of regulating the, the stock market, uh, regulating the banks, and and I don't agree with you. I, I mean, I, you're right that that Trump was, and any Republican will use the argument that it costs too much as an argument against uh, extending uh, Medicare to the rest of the population. But I think that 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 that, that the time for that reform is coming. And, and you need, and you need, a, you need a more progressive tax system in the United States. How, how many people realize what has happened to the U.S. income tax system since the 1980s? It's become progressively more regressive. Uh, that's that is one of the reasons for the inequality in the United States. It has been deliberate. It's a function not of just of globalization, of trade and and uh, technological change, but of deliberate policy choices in the United States. So it's time to start. Walking it back, and if Sanders says that, he's right. Look, um, by the way, Sanders. How many people noticed that Sanders gave a speech at SICE, of all places, uh, about a month ago? Uh, I don't think it, for some reason I don't, we five people in the room. Huh? Five Big success, guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. you did. Okay. Now, I didn't know it myself. It was actually m my research assistant Ian Bird who, who sent it to me. Thank you, Ian. But it's worth taking a look at. Go and read it. Even if I agree with you, David, that he's he's it's too old to run. I don't think he is going to run. His ideas aren't too old. He's too old. He's too Look, old. But exactly. I mean, uh, but his I ideas are young and fresh. But John, I, I just can't refrain. You know, all I'm saying is, uh, it's one of his thing. You have to be. You have to be more ambitious. You want to go there out and say extend Medicare. I'm going to reply to you. This is just the usual Democrats talking about the tax and spending, tax and spending. That's all they want to do. I'm sorry, but I think the perception of the U.S. public is deeper than that. They understand that there's something structurally broken, irreversibly broken, because we change the way we work. That's it. The way we work, organize labor, is different from what it used to be, and so we have to be far more ambitious. Now, I don't think it's just a problem of U.S. Uh, uh, politics and about uh, the U.S. left. It's actually a problem that cuts across also um, European, uh, European politics and the role of progressive party there. And I talk out of personal failures there. Jesse, uh, if, I may, if, if, <laughs> if I may, opera versus Donald at the next elections. I, I, maybe I'm old school, but I would like to see uh, a presidential election where two professional, uh, experienced politicians are running one against the other that know what they're doing and know how to, to how to govern a country. I, uh, Oprah's a wonderful person, but frankly, I don't think she is the, the the person that the United States needs as the next as the next president. That's my personal opinion and take on that one. <laughs> so I'm just I, I'm just going to close this by saying, look, you know, I mean. It's not just that there are no right answers to these issues, but that every issue can be seen from different perspectives that sheds new light, but also raises new concerns. To take two illustrations, the, the fines that were imposed on HSBC are fines that had to do with the circumvention of sanctions and the use of dollar clearing <coughs> outside of the regulatory ambit of the United States. And those fines are being viewed in Europe as a protectionist measure 
because they're being levied systematically in high multiples, primarily on European banks. And so what we think of as fines are actually just a form of tariff. By contrast, the regulations that, that Professor Unger referred to in the context of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership were actually proposed by the high-level working group on trade and employment uh, as a means to increase trade and employment by harmonizing regulation as opposed to having regulatory differences. So by getting rid of those agreements, what we're doing is not getting rid of the regulation. We're ensuring that the regulation is different from one place to the next, which creates a natural barrier to trade and commerce. And, and, and so in that context, when you look at these issues, be sure to interrogate the many different perspectives and interests that are at play because it's not immediately obvious which of these issues are right and which of these issues are left. On the contrary, as Filippo, I think, has, has explained quite persuasively, we're in such a changed structural environment that right and left are actually difficult for us to entangle. And so it's small wonder that our politicians operating in 18th century political arrangements are, are, are struggling to communicate both the relevance of the institutions they inhabit and, and the solutions to the problems that they face. Uh, and, and that's where you come in. So the more you study and the better you do, <laughs> the more likely it is the conversation in the future will be a lot better than the conversation today. Thank you very much.